Welcome and happy Mardi Gras. Um, and welcome to the fifth and last lecture of the 25th annual Lefevre Winter Series on Aging. And I'm your host, Elena Volpi. This lecture series, as you all know, um, features national and internationally acclaimed uh, speakers who focus on topics relevant to aging and geriatrics. And the series honors the memory of Dr. Edward Lefevre, who was a UTMB professor of internal medicine and a physician on the island, who uh, was a strong proponent of elder care and the study of aging at a time when very few doctors uh, were prepared to care for older people. Um, right before he died, um, the UTMB uh, started building the Division of Geriatrics, which today is uh, continuing to carry on his medical legacy. And after his death, family and friends endowed uh, this lecture series in the City Center on Aging to honor his memory. So today I'm, I'm happy to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Charlotte Peterson. Dr. Peterson is the Joseph Hamburg Endowed Professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Sciences and the Director of the Center for Muscle Biology in the College of Health Sciences at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. She received her bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Notre Dame and her PhD in biology from the University of Virginia. And she did her postdoctoral training at the NIH and at Stanford University. She started a faculty career at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, where she climbed up the entire academic ladder before being lured away or whisked away by the University of Kentucky, um, where she is right now. Um, for a period from 2016 and 2018, she was also the senior project scientist at the NIH, half time, part time. Um, uh, funded uh, by the to, of the NIH funded Motor Pack Consortium, of which UTMB is one of the clinical sites. Um, Dr. Peterson's research focuses on the biology of muscle growth and aging, and is very well funded by the NIH, including five current R1s as the principal investigator or a multiple uh, principal investigator. She has published more than 110 papers, some in very high impact journals such as uh, Nature Medicine. And she has received, in, um, uh, she has served in many study sections and advisory panels and has chaired some of them, important ones, like the Cellular Mechanism of Aging and, Dele and Developmental Study section and the AFAR Breakthrough in Gerontology Review Board. And she also been chair of the Gerontological Society of America Biological Sciences section and a member of the NIA Board of Scientific Counselors. Today, she will talk about cells and skeletal muscle aging and adaptation. So please uh, join me to welcome Dr. Charlotte Peterson. Wonderful invitation. Thank you. And for the invitation to be here, this has been, been just great. I've had a wonderful day talking to so many interesting people about all the interesting things going on here. So I um, want to tell you something about the research probably that we've been doing for the last, I would say, um, 10 years, but um, uh, focusing on some of the most recent things that we're doing, some of which is, is not published. And, and so basically, it's really changing our ways. I've been studying muscle satellite cells, which are the, the stem cells present in adult skeletal muscle for 30, 35 years. And, um, and really, it's only been in the last few that we're starting to appreciate new roles for these stem cells that were previously um, unrecognized. And so first, I just wanted to um, make sure everybody's on the same page. I don't know, with some of this, we may need to lower the blind. If, if, if we can do this, because some of the immunohistochemistry pictures, um, images may not show so well. But what I want to show you is a satellite cell. And it's called a satellite cell because of its satellite location underneath the basement membrane and along each individual muscle fiber. Um, and it's it, and so here in a single isolated muscle fiber stained with green um, is a, a satellite cell. And you can also see them in cross-section here stained with pink. And what I wanted to just show you is how we routinely, there we go, that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, and maybe the light's dimmed a little bit so that you can just see um, how um, we can count very easily this, these stem cells in muscle, primarily because of a recent de a development of an antibody, a tool 
um, that has been really useful in studying satellite cells, and it's an antibody against the transcription factor called PAC7, which in skeletal muscle is absolutely satellite cell specific. So what you can see here are these little green, you know, fluorescently labeled stem cells sitting right adjacent to each one of these individual muscle fibers, and you can see they're relatively rare in muscle. They're, they're bona fide stem cells, and what we know about them it, it, and so you can count them and express them per muscle fiber, and they change in number. Um, and what we know about them, we've known now for several years, is they really are the cell type primarily responsible for muscle repair and regeneration. So if you're a weekend warrior and you go out and you damage your muscle, um, or in an animal model, you inject cardiotoxin or some other toxin right into the muscle and cause the thing to completely degenerate, your skeletal muscle to degenerate. This activates your satellite cells. They're very migratory. They can divide. They move to the site of injury. Um, I want to, I will mention a little bit later, another cell type that moves in here and, and chews up the debris, the macrophages are really important in muscle repair and regeneration. The satellite cells proliferate, they line up, they fuse together, they form little myotubes attached to the existing uh, remnants of the myofiber or it will form a brand new myofiber, de novo, so that the, it, the muscle can repair itself, which is very unique to skeletal muscle, unlike cardiac muscle, which does not have this repair capability because it doesn't have satellite cells. Um, I want to just point out that the um, hallmark of a recently regenerated fiber is the central nucleus. Normally in a muscle fiber, the nuclei are on the periphery of the fiber to leave the center filled with the contractile apparatus, the sarcomere, so the, so the nuclei are generally at the periphery, but a newly regenerated fiber, the nucleus is in the center and then eventually will move to the periphery. So this we've known for a long time, that muscle satellite cells are really pivotal to muscle regeneration. And we've been interested in, in them in more physiological processes. And um, what, I wanted to, what I want to say is the tool that I'm going to be describing to you that we've used a lot in the last 10 years is a genetic mouse model, which allows us to specifically kill satellite cells. And so um, what we've done is, um, is kill them. And I'll tell you how we do that. It's very simple, actually, but clever. And people that have come up with some of these inducible um, um, and very specific uh, mouse models. So what we've done is we've crossed a mouse which um, has the the, recomb the Cree recombinase, a viral protein, knocked into the Pac-7 locus. And so this Cree recombinase cDNA is driven by this Pac-7 promoter. So it's only going to be expressed in satellite cells and muscle. However, it's been modified to have a, a modified estrogen receptor, it's a transgene, such that that um, Cree recombinase is not active in the absence of tamoxifen, okay? We've taken that mouse and crossed it to this Rosa 26 mouse, in which Rosa 26 is a very strong constitutive promoter, and it's driving the diphtheria uh, toxin A gene, a modified gene, which is not as toxic as diphtheria toxin, but, but it still will kill cells. However, between the promoter and the actual cDNA is a stop codon flanked by LOX P sites, which are the sites that Cree recognizes to, to delete, to recombine out a piece of DNA. So we cross these two mice together, and we have the PAC-7 DTA mouse, which I'll, I'll refer to as that, which is it, it, there's no phenotype on this mouse until you treat it with tamoxifen. And we do this by injecting five, um, uh, about two migs per day for five days, just IP. We let the tamoxifen watch out for at least two weeks, usually more. And during that time, what happens is all of the satellite cells are killed. Okay, and most of the experiments I'm going to tell you about start with mice that are four to five, four to five to six months old, so full-grown adult mice. And so whenever on the slide it says adult mice, you'll know they're that old. And I'm going to show you one um, set of experiments where we've used younger mice, uh, less than three months old, so that they're still actually growing; they're not fully mature. But I, but but what we wanted to know is what is the role of these satellite cells um, in more normal muscle adaptation to exercise, to atrophy? How do these um, satellite cells participate? And the first thing we did as proof of principle is to show that this treatment really does effectively kill satellite cells. And the, and the actual functional test is that, again, you can inject toxin. In this case, we injected barium chloride. And what you see, here's normal um, uh, uh, vehicle-treated or tamoxifen-treated um, 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 muscle. Um, 
at, at following barium chloride injection one week. And what you see is normally the muscles are regenerating nice central nuclei. You see that muscle in which has been treated with tamoxifen, as I told you, so it's satellite cell minus, has no satellite cells, completely unable to regenerate. The muscle remains mush, basically. So these really are the stem cells in muscle responsible for regeneration. But what we've been more interested in is what does this do to other kinds of muscle adaptation? And the model that I'm going to share and, and talk somewhat about, because we've been very interested in resistance training, in you know growing muscles in, in um, older people and, and to try to model this in animals. And the model I'm going to tell you about is called synergous deblation. And it's where you, you surgically remove the gastric nemius and the soleus muscle, which leaves the little plantaris muscle underneath to, to take on the load, and it hypertrophies tremendously. Within two weeks, this is SA you know, one week, two weeks, four weeks, you see the muscle within two weeks essentially doubles in size. So it's the most robust hypertrophic model in mice that there is. I should say um, this is, is how the model was first described. And now we actually mostly just do a tenonomy. If you just simply remove a small portion of the gastroc and the soleus, the plantera still hypertrophies considerably, but it's less damaging and it's... Um, less supra-physiological, because this really is a, a, very, it's a sledgehammer in terms of, of muscle hypertrophy. But what we wanted to do is, is to perform this surgical model and cause um, hypertrophy of the plantaris muscle. Another limitation of the model is obviously we can only study this single muscle because it's the only one that hypertrophies, and the plantaris muscle in a mouse is almost exclusively fast twitch. Okay, just wanted to point that out because that'll become important here in a couple minutes. But when we do this, what we see is that I want you to focus um, here first because these are the mature adult mice. If you do that in four to five, four to six month old mice, that normally this is the amount of CSA that you'd see within, and this is just 10 days, a one week to 10 days, you see that there's perfectly normal hypertrophy in the absence of satellite cells. And this has sort of gone against dogma because what you think about is when, when your muscle fiber cross-sectional area um, increases with overload, OV is the synergistic ablation overload model, when, when you hypertrophy your muscle and you increase the cytoplasm of your muscle fiber, normally what happens is a satellite cell fuses in, provides a new nucleus to enable growth. And that has always been thought to be obligatory. But this model would suggest that even in the absence of satellite cells, you can see some significant growth without myonuclear addition that's dependent on satellite cells. That's in adult animals. If you look at the two to three month old animals, you see that growth is completely is, um, abolished. And so what, what we've come and we're beginning to try to study is that there's some, in a growing animal, an additional hypertrophic stimulus um, it will not induce hypertrophy if there aren't satellite cells there to help. However, um, adult full-grown muscle has some sort of a compensatory mechanism that will allow it to grow in the absence of satellite cells. And we um, can pretty clearly show that there are no other stem cells that might be substituting because what you can see is Here's, a, a, again, a cross-section of a muscle, and here the muscle's just stained with DAPI, which intercalates into DNA so you can visualize all nuclei. And what that allows us to do, here the red border is um, using an antibody against dystrophin, which is an actual the, the muscle fiber membrane. So any nucleus that's underneath the membrane is a myonucleus, so it's part of the muscle fiber. And these nuclei that are outside of the fiber are fibroblasts, satellite cells, macrophages, any number of cells. But we can count those. And what you can see is that when we do this um, synergist ablation model for two weeks, in the presence of satellite cells, that is in tamoxifen-treated adult animals, you see that you get myonuclear accretion. Just as the dogma would say, that's absolutely true. During normal hypertrophy, satellite cells fuse in, provide a nucleus, and you maintain a constant nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. However, the growth that we see for the two weeks in the um, satellite cell ablated mice, you see no myonuclear accretion. So it's not as if there's another stem cell present in muscle that could substitute. The muscle fiber really can grow. And it has, so it has a pretty large reserve capacity without the addition of new nuclei via satellite cell fusion. But that's only up to a point. And so here, doing longer term um, a synergist ablation study, so one week, two weeks, four weeks, safe. But you see that, as I showed you, two weeks, we're seeing nice growth. It starts to plateau at four weeks. By eight weeks, it's significantly blunted. And that's both by muscle weight as well as by um, muscle fiber cross-sectional area. 
So one of our, of course, our first hypothesis was, and, and something that we're still trying to test, is that this is because we've reached a myonuclear domain ceiling. The muscle fiber can grow, but at some point you have to fuse in another nucleus to support continued growth. But as I said, we're trying to develop some new inducible mouse models in which we've got, we're close, and I had hoped I would have had some data to show you a mouse model where we can specifically delete a gene in satellite cells that it prevents them from fusing, but they're still there. And just to see, because what we really think is happening, rather than a myonuclear domain ceiling, we think the muscle's becoming fibrotic without satellite cells. And that's illustrated here by two different stains, Picroserious red, which stains collagen. You can see that in the tamoxifen-treated animals, after eight weeks of synergistic ablation, the red between the muscle fibers, there's some swaths in there. You really see an increase in extracellular matrix in the muscle, which is also apparent um, using um, wheat germ agglutinin, which um, it, uh, stains glycosaminoglycans in the extracellular matrix. You can see that after um, ablating satellite cells with tamoxifen and then doing this eight weeks of synergist ablation, you see there's a lot more extracellular matrix around the fibers. And we really think this is what's um, inhibiting growth. And um, as I said, we're trying to develop a, a mouse model now that would allow the satellite cells to still be there, so we don't kill them, but they can't fuse. And our hypothesis would be, well, them being there and, and, and the ability to activate them in the synergist ablation model, but them um, so that perhaps they could regulate this extracellular matrix, limit this fibrosis without fusing. We want to really directly test this idea. Um, but in the meantime, we've performed a lot of... Um, mechanistic in vitro cell culture experiments, which we've published. So I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail, but I'm just going to give you the highlights because we wanted to understand what is it about satellite cells being present? Is it that they really are um, able to influence and help in the, tish, in the um, remodeling of the extracellular matrix that would enable growth? And without them there, if extracellular matrix is accumulating, maybe it's just physically limiting the ability of a muscle fiber to grow in response to a, a hypertrophic stimulus. So when we start to think about that, well, satellite cells might be inhibiting extracellular matrix, the, the cell type in muscle that produces the most collagen and the most extracellular matrix are fibroblasts. So we did a bunch of um, satellite cell fibroblast co-culture and showed that, in fact, when you co-culture satellite cells, isolated, purified mouse satellite cells with muscle fibroblasts, you'll see a reduction in fibroblast gene expression of collagens, fibronectin, a whole bunch of extracellular matrix genes. So we wanted to drill down to, uh, into that a little bit more, and so we did conditioned medium experiments. And I'm going to say in a lot of the slides, and I may misspeak, but once you isolate a satellite cell out of a muscle, people generally don't call it a satellite cell anymore because it's not in the satellite location. They'll it's, and it becomes activated, so it's dividing. So now, um, generally, people call them myogenic progenitor cells or myoblasts, but those are just the daughters of satellite cells after they've been dividing, and especially once you put them in vitro. So what we've done is we've con collected conditioned medium from MPCs um, and showed that it, the, the conditioned medium is as effective um, as co-culture in, in inhibiting collagen gene expression in fibroblasts. But then we also isolated exosomes from the MPC conditioned medium and just put those on fibroblasts and showed those were as effective. So that the, our hypothesis then was that satellite cells or MPCs are producing, releasing EVs and that those um, extracellular vex vesicles or exosomes contain things that are inhibiting gene expression, specifically in fibroblasts. And when you start talking about inhibition of gene expression by exosomes, the thing that comes up immediately are microRNAs. And I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with the microRNA literature. These are very short, single-stranded RNAs, which bind to messenger RNAs and cause them to be unstable, so degraded. So we, what we wanted to do, so we isolated these exosomes from MPCs, and we labeled them with acridine orange, which is a dye that just intercalates into all the RNAs. And we put those exosomes and washed them a bunch and put them on fibroblasts. And what we saw is that the fibroblasts turn orange. And so we really think that what's going on, and we followed up on this, that, um, that the, the way in vivo the satellite cells um, and activated satellite cells and MPCs are regulating the environment is by direct communication via EVs with fibroblasts to limit 
extracellular matrix gene expression, thereby facilitating remodeling. We profiled just by um, gene expression analysis all of the microRNAs that are in the MPC exosomes, and there are a large number of them, almost 100, but the one that is the most abundant is MIR-206 which is a microRNA, which is muscle-specific, actually. And in fact, our work um, has implied that it is actually, might be even more than just muscle-specific, but satellite cell-specific. Because here I'm showing you just um, a, a analysis of MIR-206 expression in muscle sham after this overload, the, the synergist ablation surgery, either in um, the vehicle-treated animals or the tamoxifen treated animals. So these don't have any satellite cells. And whereas overload causes a nice increase in MIR-206 normally, if you don't have satellite cells there, it doesn't increase. And so we've done some in vitro experiments where we've just put MIR-206 directly on fibroblasts. And if you do that, as opposed to a scrambled um, microRNA, you see you inhibit collagen gene expression in fibroblasts. And similarly, if we take our MPCs, and transfect them with a, um, a MIR-206 antagonist, um, and then isolate um, exosomes from those cells, what you see is now they are um, they're much less effective in um, uh, those exosomes are not effective in blocking collagen gene expression anymore. So we really um, are following this path that, that satellite cells are communicating with fibroblasts, so they're doing more, they're helping to modulate the um, extracellular environment to facilitate remodeling and to facilitate growth. So because we can deplete satellite cells, and because I know uh, Elena mentioned grant review panels that I sit on, almost every grant that I read, aging grant, to do with satellite cells says, well, you know, you lose satellite cells with age, you lose these stem cells, not in every muscle, but in many muscles, they decline with age, their function declines with age, and the grant will say, so we're studying them because that's what causes sarcopenia. I, you read that all the time, and so we thought, well, wouldn't this satellite cell depletion model be a premature model of aging? If we're depleting the satellite cells in, the, in these animals, if that's really causal to sarcopenia, then we ought to see premature muscle wasting in the animals. And so we set out and did a large cohort of mice, and I'm, it, this just summarizes the experimental design. So again, at four months of age, we treated the animals with either um, the PAC-7 DTA mice, again, with either tamoxifen or vehicle, um, to, to, in the tamoxifen was to deplete satellite cells. We gave them a, um, uh, uh, and then basically what we did is most of the animals we just let live in their cages for 20 months, okay? An old animal is, is 24 months is a pretty geriatric animal. Those animals, and in the next slides I'm going to call young, those we treated with tamoxifen, we waited a month, and in a whole cohort we just sacrificed them at five months of age. So I'm calling those young mice in the next few slides. And that is, they lived one month without satellite cells, okay? The tamoxifen compared to the vehicle. Now in the others, as I said, we just put them back in their cages and they lived for 20 months. And in a small subset, just before we killed them, we actually did the synergist ablation serum. Um, um, uh, either did the synergist ablation surgery or we injected barium chloride into the other leg just to see what was going on with the satellite cells. And then we killed um, that, all those cohorts at 24 months, okay? And those are called old. So they have basically lived essentially the vast majority of their adult life, hopefully with satellite cells depleted. That was the first test was would they stay depleted? And to our surprise and good luck, which I still don't really understand given that satellite cells are stem cells, and we don't ever kill 100%. I mean, nothing in biology really is 100%. But what you can see is that even after two years, so in the 24-month-old uh, mice, you see the number of satellite cells in the young vehicle. You can see that um, uh, tamoxifen effectively in the five-month-old animals, it really effectively depletes satellite cells. And now if you look at the older animals, depending on the muscle, and I'm showing that here, you see, you see a lower number of satellite cells just in the vehicle-treated animal, which is pretty dramatic in the plantaris, less so in the gastroc, TA, EDL, and, um, and, and somewhat in the soleus. You see that even after two years, they don't repopulate. 
and we're trying to understand this, have a number of mouse models going. My current hypothesis is that there is our he their hetero satellite cells are somewhat heterogeneous in their PAC7 expression, and that there's some work by um, Sherigim Tagbash um, in Paris that those satellite cells that are expressing the highest level of PAC7 are the bona fide stem cells. And those that have lower levels of expression are actually um, committed progenitors and they're not bona fide stem cells. So our current hypothesis is that we are really effectively depleting all the bona fide stem cell satellite cells and those few cells that might be remaining uh, that are PAC7 positive are not bona fide stem cells. I mean, so they're there, but they can't repopulate is what I'm trying to say. Um, so you see, just as a function of age in the vehicle-treated animals, you see a loss, as I said, in the plantaris muscle, which is the data I've shown you so far, a pretty significant 50% loss. And what you can see is throughout the life of um, these animals following um, either the, the younger animals, the five-month-old animals, or the 24-month-old animals, the satellite cells remain very effectively depleted so that these animals have lived the majority of their life with far fewer satellite cells than they lose during aging. If you, if you get my drift. And, as, and so one would think, yeah, this is then going to be um, an aging model, which was supported from it, what I told you is right before we killed some of the old mice, we injected barium chloride. And in fact, what I hope you can see here in these 23-month-old animals when they were injected with barium, barium chloride, or, or 23 in three weeks, because we a week later killed them, you can see regeneration in old animals is less effective. This is actually into the tibialis anterior. You see some centrally located nuclei, but there's a lot more disorganization. So muscle regeneration, satellite cell function is, is impaired with aging. And in those that have no satellite cells, there is absolutely no muscle regeneration. So we really have effectively killed satellite cells, and they've remained depleted all this time. However, there's no effect on the size of the muscle. So this doesn't induce atrophy. So what you can see is that here are um, you know, the old vehicle. So here are the, the, the five-month-old animal, either vehicle or tamoxifen, and here are the older animals. And you see their sarcopenia, that they've lost muscle fiber cross-sectional area, but there's no effect of tamoxifen versus vehicle. So that satellite cell loss does not uh, cause um, age-associated muscle wasting. And to our surprise, the muscle fibers, you can isolate single fibers, and again, use just DAPI staining that stains all nuclei, and you can count them that there's no difference in the number of uh, myonuclei per muscle fiber. As there's some talk, and, and thought that during your lifetime, your myonuclei get damaged, they're lost, and you just sort of turn over your nuclei with satellite cells. But our work would suggest that's not happening. Now, there could be another stem cell population that does this, that just turns over myonuclei with age. We are developing some new strategy with reporter mice that will allow us to label satellite cell nuclei permanently and track them over the life of an animal and to try to get at this question because some of this is rather surprising, but it, it, whether satellite cells are involved in muscle maintenance even over the lifespan. Now, these are animals that weren't injured or weren't overloaded. is is really a, um, an open question, but our data in this mouse model would suggest that they're not involved in that process either. But the muscles do become more fibrotic. These muscles in which the animals lived without satellite cells for most of their life, there's more extracellular matrix surrounding um, the muscle fibers. So this, this was rather surprising, but then we thought, well, okay, so maybe satellite cells not being there doesn't cause sarcopenia, but maybe it's contributing to the inability or the uh, reduced ability of aged muscle to hypertrophy. So that's why we did the synergist ablation surgery in a subset of animals that were just over 23 months old before we killed them just to, to see how they grew. Um, to see if that, uh, that compensatory mechanism in adult animals that allow them to grow without satellite cells was still operative in old animals. And what I can say is that um, hypertrophy was really blunted in these animals. You see that there was an increase in weight, and it's different, but that um, it, whether they had satellite cells or not, but this is really um, blunted compared to adult, young adult animals. And in terms of cross-sectional area, this actually wasn't significant. So regardless of whether, so this is an overloaded um, 
or this is, um, you know, the vehicle versus the um, tamoxifen-treated sham. And you can see with two weeks of synergist ablation, there was basically no increase in cross-sectional area in the mice. However, in those mice that still had satellite cells, you did see myonuclear accretion. So in these animals, the satellite cells reduced in number, but they were able to fuse in in response to the overload stimulus. There weren't satellite cells available to do that, but neither really grew. So it didn't really get at our question about uh, apparently this compensatory mechanism, but, but there really is, and something that's been reported here, this anabolic resistance. The animals just didn't grow very well in response to synergist ablation. So here I'm going to uh, take a break. I'm going to summarize what, what I've told you here, um, and that is that muscle regeneration, maintenance, and response to hypertrophic stimulus appear to have different satellite cell requirements in the mouse, that compensatory mechanisms exist in, exist in adult but not growing muscle to enable hypertrophy in the absence of satellite cells. Um, satellite cells repress ECM production by fibroblasts, potentially through delivering of microRNAs. Um, Satellite cell depleted muscle becomes fibrotic over time, which we would hypothesize does limit its ability to grow. Um, Myar nuclear accretion, which I just showed you in the last slide, is insufficient to drive hypertrophy in aged mouse muscle. And finally, what I want to end on and here and, and follow up on is all these results that I've, or the results I've just shown you about these old animals, that lifelong satellite cell depletion in sedentary mice impairs um, the muscle regenerative capacity without affecting sarcopenia, right? But I don't know how many of you work with animals. You know, these mice live in a little bitty shoebox their whole life, which is not really very normal for a mouse. Very sedentary. They don't get to move very much. And we got to thinking, well, that doesn't really reflect, although maybe it reflects a lot of human life, <laughs> um, where you li live much of your life fairly sedentary, but we thought maybe we would get completely different results if we allowed the mice to be physically active their whole life. So we un then undertook a whole another um, set of experiments where we um, it did the, and I think I have a little, yeah, okay, so what we did was wanted to test this same hypothesis but in physically active mice. So we took, um, in this case, slightly older to start the experiment, five-month-old mice, treated them with tamoxifen or vehicle, um, and then at seven months of age, so wash out the tamoxifen, wash out so there's no more effect of the drug, um, satellite cells are killed. We then um, gave them free access to a running wheel. Um, and then we killed the mice at 20 months of age. And I'll tell you why. This was a bit younger than we were originally planning, but I will tell you why that is. And so we did a large cohort of mice here wanting to see if the results we would get would be different um, in, uh, in terms of the effect of satellite cell depletion on, um, in physically active mice. So the first thing I just want to convince you again, so now we're always, the color scheme is always going to be the same. You know, our, the, the animals that had access just to a locked wheel, either, you know, this is the, the vehicle treated or tamoxifen, so either satellite cell plus or minus, a locked wheel, and then the running will always be these colors either with satellite cells or without. And what you can see is that, again, um, satellite cells are present in muscle. Um, and that they increase significantly, slightly, but significantly with just the running stimulus. And now the beauty of, of doing these analysis that I'm going to show you here is that we can do all the hind limb muscles. We're not restricted to the plantaris, and the soleus is a very oxidative muscle. Or as I said, the plantaris is really exclusively type 2 fast twitch. The soleus is more mixed and much more oxidative, so it has um, uh, at least 50% more of um, oxidative type 1 fibers. And so we can do look at both muscles, and you can see satellite cells increase slightly with the running stimulus, and I had sort of thought initially that the running stimulus may repopulate the satellite cells, that, that this would be something you could say, oh, if you're really physically active, you're going to maintain your satellite cells, and, and it, it, you can see they still remain very effectively depleted. Um, and this is reflected in myonuclear accretion or the lack thereof. So what we found in this model, so now these are just running. Now that mice, and I'm going to show you how much they run. This is um, the mice we're using. Are, um, the background strain is uh, C57 black 6, and they love to run. And the mice will run 10 kilometers a night. They basically will basically run almost all night long on the wheel if given free access. 
And what I'm, I'm showing you here is that in the plantaris muscle, um, this was not statistically significant, but you can see that the, the runners, there was a trend for an increase in myonuclear uh, number, um, which that trend, although, as again, it was not significant. But in the soleus, it was significant that you see that the myofibers after the running were, had more myonuclei that was, uh, uh, was abolished in those that were, had no satellite cells. Again, suggesting that this stimulus did cause, that, that what I just showed you, small increase in satellite cell number, caused myonuclear accretion, so the fibers have more nuclei in them, which was um, abolished um, when there were no satellite cells present. And this running stimulus caused a nice fiber type switch, at least in the plantaris now. Since the soleus is so oxidative already, we didn't see a significant shift in, in fiber type composition. But what we did see in the plantaris is a d decrease in the fastest fibers. So in, in mice, unfortunately, it's not completely translatable to humans. They have these, this... Uh, myosin called 2B myosin, which is not present, is not expressed in humans, but it's the most glycolytic uh, type 2 fiber in the mouse. And you can see at the end of the running, there was a nice decrease in 2B fibers and an increase in the more oxidative 2A fibers. And as I said, the plantaris has basically no type 1 fibers in it. So the animals train nicely. You saw this nice fiber type switch, at least in the plantaris. No fiber type switch in the soleus, but we did see um, an increase in fiber size, a hypertrophy in, in the fibers were larger in the runners than in the non-runners. And that occurred both in the plantaris and the soleus. In the plantaris, it differed by fiber type. So just if you look at the pink, those are the runners with satellite cells, and they're higher in all cases, and, and not if there were no satellite cells present. Now, the... Overall, there was no difference in mean fiber CSA because 2B fibers are, much, are the biggest fibers. They're bigger since they were converted. We saw a shift from 2B to 2A, and 2A fibers are smaller. Even though each one increased, that the fact that we shifted from larger 2B fibers to smaller 2A fibers, there was no overall difference in CSA. But there was a difference in the, in the soleus. So you can see that um, both the type 1 and the 2A fibers increased in size following the runner were higher in, in uh, were larger following running and this resulted in a, a nearly significant increase in overall um, fiber CSA. But here's a caveat that I, I want to tell you about is that so they trained um, the, in terms of fiber type um, they increased their fiber CSA was higher um, they had myonuclear nuclear accretion and, and so we are, you know, would conclude that satellite cells are necessary for these adaptations. And whereas in physically active mice, there really is a deficit of a bad phenotype if you deplete satellite cells. But even more than just a direct effect of satellite cells, what we found over time is that those animals that didn't have satellite cells ran less which really complicates the interpretation. And we're having a hard time getting this published because it, the animals that didn't have satellite cells ran less. And I hope you can see this is in their kilometers per day. So here's the, the satellite cells re, deep, a replete, I mean, the ones that had satellite cells. And you can see uh, per, every night they ran about 10 um, kilometers a night, which over, as they got older, f faded down. But you can see all along the way um, the Tamoxifen-treated, satellite cell-depleted animals ran less. Um, they spent um, less time on the wheel, and they ran slower. And you can see that the reason that we went ahead and stopped the experiment at 20 months is that the, the satellite cell-depleted um, animals were almost not running at all, and we were afraid we were going to lose the training effect. So at, we made the executive's decision as opposed to letting go out to 24 months, which was our original plan, and to do... Uh, uh, you know, center distillation surgery, we would stop the experiment because they, their, their running activity was really falling off. And during the course of this experiment, you know, thought, wow, you know, of all the things I thought growth would be really affected in the sedentary animals, I didn't think running behavior would be affected. And as it turned out, it was one of the uh, students who was taking care and going in and checking and the technicians on the animals say, well, that's because it's, you know, they're really uncoordinated. I don't know if you all have ever seen a mouse running wheel, but they're, you know, there's uh, just wire and they have to run and they have to grab onto the cage and they just, just run. I said, oh, these guys, they're really uncoordinated and they slip all the time and their foot gets stuck and they just, and even if you pick them up, they kind of flop around and they're just not very coordinated. 
Oh, well, that was interesting. So we did some tests of their function, their balance, uh, rotor rod test, balance beam, and the mice really were very much less coordinated. So we thought, well, what could this be? And then we, we did some reading and um, had a friend who was very into studying um, proprioception and, and spindle fibers. I don't know how many of you are. There's a special kind of intrafusal fiber in muscle called a spindle fiber, which is really the mechanosensor in muscle, and it allows the animal to know where it is in space. And, 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 um, and so we took a look at the spindle fibers in the mice. And this is a, a typical spindle fiber, and, and you know, on lower magnification, you can see they're really pretty. They look sort of like four-leaf clovers, and you can see in any given muscle section, sometimes none, sometimes one. The most I've ever seen in a given cross-section of a total mouse muscle is three. But what you can see is normally they have a pretty standard organization, and you can see in those that don't have satellite cells, they're really disorganized. I'm pointing here to just one satellite cell that's stained with Pac-7 antibody in pink. Um, they tend to have, here's another one up here, they tend to have a lot of um, satellite cells in them. And here, of course, you don't see any, and you can see that the, the lobe size is different, there's more extracellular matrix around the spindle, and so we're in the process of working with some neuroscientists to see if the spindle fiber activity is actually less because we think that perhaps the spindle fibers turn over here. I guess I should show in the next slide where it's, where it's quantified. Spindle fibers may have a more stringent requirement that they turn over more often perhaps and are more reliant on satellite cells. And I think this is, is potentially important because if during aging your satellite cell number is decreased, which may not cause sarcopenia, but if your spindle fiber function now is reduced, that could really contribute to falls in the elderly. If it's really making them less coordinated, that they have less um, mechano, you know, ability to know where they are in space. So, again, a role for satellite cells I never would have predicted, but but something that um, that we're going to follow up on. Another thing I, I just wanted to end on because it's I, it's very preliminary, but. Um, what we've done is we've done RNA-seq on all the muscles and trying to identify pathways. And one thing that has, has really jumped out at us is that GPCR signaling um, seems to be um, preferentially activated in animals with satellite cells compared to those that aren't, and, and, and not in the soleus. The soleus, as I showed you, that there's more fusion, and they, it may be more dependent on satellite cell fusion, and maybe that's why it's, it's not growing in the, um, in, the, in the animals that are lifelong exercising. But what our current hypothesis in here, I just showed a, a cartoon of GPCR seeing a one um, uh, G protein um, is uh, uh, G alpha I, and um, a group for David Glass's group published a couple of years ago how this is really important for hypertrophy in, in muscle, stem, muscle cells in vitro. And so what we're thinking is maybe one of the ways that satellite cells are, if they are expressing some um, GPCR ligands, and that they may signal to the muscle fiber, and this may be a pathway that hasn't really been studied very much and is important over and above fusing in in the plantaris to signal and that that pathway may be important for growth specifically in the plantaris, maybe not so much in the soleus, so that I do think this is going to identify maybe potentially new mechanisms of actions of satellite cells and pathways that are really um, important to facilitate growth. Um, so just here to... Um, close this section, I just wanted to, um, some things that I've pretty much all um, um, summarized for you um, about the conclusions of, of satellite cells in, in, um, in uh, physically active mice as opposed to sedentary mice, that they may be important, but for reasons that, that I would not necessarily have, um, have predicted. And what I want to close just the last couple minutes is to tell you about, you know, why, how we think this translates to humans. We do human muscle studies as well and, and been studying satellite cells. Of course, you can't make inducible genetic models and things, but you can, you can certainly look at, um, at satellite cells in human muscle. And, and I just wanted to um, start out by, again, it, 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 nice in, in human muscle where they're just the, the three fiber types and the mostly type 1 and 2As with 2X really being more associated with a sedentary lifestyle in, in most people unless you're a really ex exquisitely trained um, uh, sprinter or, or athlete. And so um, with the vastus, which is where these biopsies all came from, and I know a lot of you work on vastus lateralis biopsies, we wanted to sort of look to see if we could 
tell if any of this translated from mouse into humans. And the study that we began to look at was one that was using um, stationary ergometry, so just a cycle training study. And this was in middle-aged, sort of um, uh, moderately o um, overweight um, individuals. And what you can see is, and they train, they cycle train for 12 weeks at, you know, progressive and, and at, you know, 70% of heart rate max. And they worked very hard. And we saw that that um, that we saw a, a shift in fiber type frequency, so they gained 2A fibers and decreased 2X, so it looks like they trained effectively. And we did see modest hypertrophy in these individuals. You see that their fiber CSA after 12 weeks of training was higher, and you saw this nice, you know, typical switch in the histogram, where now you see a, a switch to the shift to the right, so the higher percentage of larger fibers. Um, and um, that both type 1 and 2A fibers hypertrophy. But now getting to the satellite cell question, if you look at that in here, I just wanted to show you with staining in human muscle. So this is a type 1 myosin antibody laminin. And so that's in the basement membrane. So satellite cells, these are all in the same section, are underneath the laminin. Um, so you can tell which fiber they're associated with, DAPI staining, and you overlay them. And so you can count satellite cells those that are specifically associated under the basement membrane with a type 2 fiber versus a type 1 fiber. So, and, and this becomes relevant because of, you know, what I was telling you about all our hypertrophy work is really in the plantaris, which is a fast twitch type 2 muscle. And what we found was that PAC-7, the satellite cells increased in abundance in the muscle, but this was really specific to type 1 fibers, which surprised us. Their, the increase in those associated with type 2 fibers did not occur. And this was um, associated with a myonuclear accretion, and that is if we counted the myofiber nuclei, they only increased in number in the type 1 fibers and not the type 2 fibers. So we really think that there is something going on and, and that there is a fiber type specific requirement for satellite cells and that it is going to translate to humans. But in the course of this study, I, I want to circle back around. Another cell type came to our attention, which is even more abundant in muscle than satellite cells. And these are macrophages. That there are resident macrophages which have anti-inflammatory properties, or M2-like, and one of the markers that is most distinctive for them is, is a cell surface marker called CD206. So CD11B is a pan marker, and here I'm showing you one, two, three, four, five macrophages, and of those, and this is resident uninjured muscle, four of them express 206. Here's the only one that's probably not an M2-like, probably a more inflammatory macrophage. And these are present and at, at nearly one every two fibers, so they're way more abundant than satellite cells. And in that study I just showed you, in that cycle study, we went back and looked at them, because I have a student who's very interested in macrophages and muscle, and what you can see is that they also, like satellite cells, increase in abundance with training in that population, that they are very nicely correlated their abundance with the increase in fiber CSA, and that they're very well correlated. The increase in satellite cells and the increase in M2 macrophages are very well correlated. And we have lots of really beautiful pictures. So here's DAPI just staining all nuclei. Here's um, CD206 staining. Here's PAC-7 staining, and you can see we often find the M2 macrophage in the satellite cells very closely associated. So again, we think this is another case where there's a lot of communication, cell-cell communication. I've already talked to you about satellite cells communicating with, with fibroblasts, potentially. We also think they're communicating heavily with, um, with um, macrophages, and that this, the macrophages may produce growth factors like hepatocyte growth factor, IGF-1, which may be directly influencing satellite cells. And this is a new area of research in the lab that we think is going to be very fruitful. Um, similarly, um, some of the products of macrophages like IL-4 is an, a product of an anti-inflammatory macrophage. That increases with training. IL-6 decreases. And just one teaser. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, Marcus Bauman, has been very interested in FN14, which is a receptor for a TG, uh, TNF family member. TNF-alpha is an inflammatory cytokine, but they've showed it really might be important in muscle adaptation. This receptor goes up, and but it mediates inflammatory signaling. It just turns out that M2 macrophages on their cell surface have a, have a molecule called CD163, which happens to be the soluble tweak receptor. Um, Tweak is the um, 
tweak is what binds to FN14. So we think another way that M2 macrophages are working is that they are secreting this soluble tweak receptor, sucking it up, so FN14 now doesn't mediate inflammatory signaling. So we think there's a lot of interplay between satellite cells and, um, uh, and other cell types in muscle. And we're particularly excited about this. We just completed a, a clinical trial in older adults, resistance training, um, and, and our original hypothesis was that metformin would augment the response to resistance training. A lot of older people don't respond very well to resistance training. So we thought that the, adding metformin into the mix would potentially convert res non-responders to responders. Um, that We just published the results of that trial. It came out negative. Metformin actually inhibits the response to resistance training. But in looking at those muscles from all of those individuals, again, at the M2 macrophages, they increase. Now, this is older people. As I said, the previous study was sort of middle-aged, um, overweight people. And you see this really nice correlation, better even than satellite cells, the increase in fiber CSA to M2 macrophage. So the change in CSA was correlated to the change in macrophages. So this is a whole new avenue, and we've begun doing a bunch of single cell sequencing to characterize macrophage, different macrophage populations before and after training, and, and developing some in vitro cell culture models as well as animal models where we're trying to specifically kill M2 macrophages in muscle, much like we did the satellite cells, kill the macrophages and see if this now, what this does to the ability of the animal to, to hypertrophy. So all, all sort of new areas, but I just think the cell biology that's going on in muscle, I think there's a lot we don't know yet. So just from this part, I just want to conclude again um, and just say that um, type 1 fibers may have a more stringent requirement for satellite cells and that we really think M2 macrophages are going to be really important both through communication with satellite cells and potentially through other mechanisms modulating signaling. And if I just wanted you to leave with a few take-home messages, um, I think the necessity of satellite cells for um, muscle hypertrophy, it appears fiber type specific. It's dependent on age, whether the animal's still growing or the human being is still growing, adult or, or older. And it may differ depending on the mode of exercise. And that most importantly, that cross communication between satellite cells and other cell types and muscles may regulate the micro environment, um, which there, thereby will um, really impact adaptability and ultimately physical function. And that if there's one message to leave you with, you know, uh, traditionally it's just thought, well, all satellite cells, you increase, they fuse in a nucleus to a fiber, and you need that to grow. And we really think that they do very m many more things in muscle and are important for adaptation than simply that. And so with that, I'll end and want to acknowledge my, um, my current lab members that have participated in, in every aspect of this project. You might have noticed I mentioned Chris Fry's name a lot. A lot of the early work was done with Chris, um, who did a, a beautiful job, and other postdocs, graduate students, and uh, technicians who have now moved on to other, um, other positions, but really were pivotal in much of the work I told you. This is a long-time collaboration with colleagues at UK, John McCarthy, Esther dupont Verstegden, and Phil Kern is my um, uh, uh, study physician, um, really been a collaborator, it does all my muscle biopsy and is really um, helpful. And then the last study that I told you about the, the, is, was a two-center clinical trial with resistance training and metformin with Marcus Bauman at um, UAB. So with that, I will stop and happy to try to answer any questions. What age category in humans did you consider to be aging on the exercise? Well, in this study, we recruited anybody over 65. And our average age was 74. The age range was 68 to 92. And it was both, it was equally divided between men and women as well. And I, the women, you know, tended to gain the most. They worked very hard, and um, so it was men and women. And it was a total of 109 participants, so 50 with metformin and about 50, 50 uh, metformin and placebo. Did we destroy all the satellite the satellite cells? cells. Yeah, <laughs> we haven't. Um, had the need for that because, you know, tamoxifen, it's an estrogen analog, and if you give it to the animal long term, there's studies out there showing it causes cardiac hypertrophy. It's got 
I mean, it's an estrogen analog. You know, a tamoxifen, you give it to, you know, it's a, it's a chemotherapy <coughs> agent. So we want to do it as low dose and as short a time as possible. So this, I mean, this has been surprising. Initially, when I started these out, we started, okay, we'll treat them and we'll let them go a long time. Okay, let's retreat, retreat. And then we found that the satellite cells, once you kill them, they're gone. So we don't retreat. Now, in the experiments we're just starting now, we've used, we've developed some new mouse strains where we're taking a, a promoter, not the PAC-7, a promoter that's macrophage specific and crossing it to the DTA mouse and we want to kill macrophages, so kill animals. The problem is you can do that, well, the spleen, has, it's going to produce monocytes that go into the blood and they're going to repopulate. And so we're just starting this to how do if we kill them and then we do synergist ablation or whatever, the macrophages are going to repopulate. And so we may have to resort to giving repeated tamoxifen and I don't want to do that but I don't know how else. And then we thought, you know, you can kill macrophages with um, liposomes with, what is it, clondronate or something. So we thought about, okay, let's hit them with tamoxifen, kill them. And then how do we keep them from coming in? But I'm afraid we're going to have to do really short experiments because I think the tamoxifen is going to screw. I think it's going to complicate the interpretation because I think it might cause atrophy. It might cause all kinds of things. It's a problem, I think, long term, for sure. So, Char, uh, you've um, mentioned the macrophages and inflammation. So, you know, we all know that as we get older and we exercise uh, afterwards, it kind of hurt, and so you want to take some anti-inflammatories. What do you think, based on your research and also the literatures out there, what would happen if you take an anti-inflammatory drug after you exercise? Is it going to impede your muscle growth or is it going to favor your muscle growth? Well, you know, there's conflicting literature out there, and there, there's quite a lot, with both with um, uh, you know, um, ibuprofen and acetaminophen <coughs> and these things that from the Trappy, you know, Todd Trappy mm -hmm. group and even Wendy Court, I think, has done some um, anti-inflammatory stuff. What we're seeing in our models, depending on where we, when we take the biopsies, these resident M2 macrophages increase with training. We don't see a huge increase and maybe we're missing the window of, of M1 inflammatory macrophages, frankly. Um, and just in our RNA-seq, you know, after exercise and various things, man, you know, there are, we don't see a lot of markers of inflammation that, you know, when you do RNA-seq, that when it, it takes some cutoff point for background, the thing, the first thing that drops out are all the, um, pretty much all the, the cytokines. And you can go in and, like some of this, we did real-time PCR, and if you, you know, amplify for 38 cycles, you can detect things. But I don't know about the whole inflammation, and I know, you know, acutely, what did Todd show acutely? Um, ibuprofen inhibits protein synthesis after exercise, but long term, people that took it all along seem to hypertrophy more. I, I, I haven't, so I'm not clear on that. It's a really good question, and I don't think we actually know. And, you know, and I thought I sort of understood his work, but then he showed sort of the same thing with acetaminophen which doesn't have the same effects as ibuprofen at all and you know it's not maybe not even cox i it's very confusing so i don't know what to say i you know think i'd say i don't think it's necessarily going to be a terrible thing and if you take a, a ibuprofen or an acetaminophen and it means you're more functional and you'll tend to exercise again go ahead and take it <laughs> okay. that's a good, that's if you're that message. sore that you're not going to exercise again you know yeah. yeah i don't know i don't know but i'm not Boy, inflammation, and we're just, we're, it's, not, I, it's, I don't think it's a big a thing, but it may be we're not taking the time point at the right time for the biopsies or, but you know, we've even tried, and if you all tried after an exercise study, just draw blood and look at serum and look at inflammatory cytokines. Yeah. All right. All right, so um, it's six o'clock, so, <laughs> and it's Mardi Gras, so. Oh, <laughs> says the bon and oh way more UTMB. better. Working together to work wonders.